folks have their cameras on. All right, so the, the webinar now is being recorded. I won't repeat what I've said, but the webinar now is being recorded. Again, so if I could ask folks to mute themselves, both their audio and video, because again, this is an international conference and sometimes it does get difficult with, um, with connectivity issues. So the webinar will be 90 minutes. We do have four guest speakers as well as a poet. We'll start with two guest speakers, including Andrea Da Silva, Carolina uh, Beretta, sorry, our poet Jennifer Jean, as well as Joy Smith and Rachel Lloyd. And I will be doing an introduction to all of them prior to their presentation. After the presentations, we're going to open it up to a question and answer period. And we will use as much time as we possibly can, knowing that we also have one final segment, which is closing comments by Dr. Ingrid Daniels. She will provide closing comments. Um, Ingrid is, of course, the immediate past president of the World Federation for, for Mental Health and is part of the webinar organizing committee. What I'd like to do is encourage everyone here, if you could go into the chat box and just let us know what country you're from. We'd be, del we'd be delighted to know where everyone is from today. Um, let me say this, so this, these are our speakers rather, these are our speakers, I'm delighted to be introducing them to you by way of their photos initially. Let me say that we would like to acknowledge the lands that all of the webinar working committee and all of the guest speakers come from, we would like to acknowledge the lands. I come to you specifically from Canada, more specifically from the University of Manitoba, which is located on Treaty 1 territory. which is located on Treaty 1 territory, uh, sorry, and the lands of the Anishinaabe, the Cree, the Oji Cree, and the Denny's people, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Now, let me see again, I'm looking through my notes. Um, now, one, one point, as some of you may know, or as you may know, Pope Francis is currently in Canada, meeting with Indigenous leaders and people, on Monday, he formally apologized to the survivors of the residential school system here in Canada for the harms they experienced while in residential schools. Today, the focus of our webinar is also about harms. However, the harms are those experienced through human trafficking. So I'd like to start our program by introducing you to Andrea De Silva. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'll introduce you. Andrea Da Silva has worked for United Nations since 2014, working on issues related to gender, migration, and conflict. She worked as a program manager for the International Organization for Migration in Iraq and Somalia on programs that supported vulnerable women, including counter-trafficking programs for women affected by extremist arms groups, and on programs that built gender-sensitive gender community policing. Andrea currently works for UN Women as a program and coordinator consultant in the Ending Violence Against Women section at UN Women's headquarters in New York, where she provides technical support to UN Women's anti-trafficking work, including collaborating with other organizations through the Interagency Coordination Group Against Trafficking. So on that note, I turn it over to Andrea and I will mute but just so that you have someone else to look at and not just a blank screen or boxes with names, I will keep my video on unless it becomes a problem. So I turn it over to you, Andrea. Thank you so much, Tracy, for that introduction. And I'm just gonna share my screen so we can get started with this presentation. So just let me know, Tracy, if you uh, can't see or you can see. I'm assuming you can see. <laughs> We cannot see your screen. Oh, okay. All right, let's try that again. Share. There we go, they are arriving. Okay. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, so thank you um, for having me and inviting me to this event. Um, it's a really important topic. Um, and today I wanted to look uh, specifically at the vulnerabilities that women and girls face in trafficking and the impact of mental health. 
I will uh, place a little bit of a caveat here. I am not a mental health expert, and I'm sure that there are those of you in the group that know far more about it than, than I do. So, you know, I'm really looking forward to the discussion afterwards, um, you know, to take this, take this further. So today, I, what I want to talk about is I want to look at, uh, you know, the gender dimensions um, of trafficking. We're going to go a little bit into what the data says um, and also how um, trafficking is a form of gender-based violence. Um, we'll also be looking at the intersection of vulnerabilities that women and girls face and talk a little bit about that mental health impact um, for women and girls. And we'll go through some very brief key recommendations. So these are some statistics um, that come from the United Nations Office Against Drugs and Crime. And um, they put out a bi-monthly, a bi-annual uh, report on reported cases in tra of, of trafficking. So you can see here that women are disproportionately, women and girls are disproportionately represented as victims of trafficking. And as this is especially apparent when it is for the purpose of sexual exploitation, which is the um, most detected form of trafficking, according to this data. Um, I do wanna note though, that these figures are uh, from reported cases and, it sh and there, there are many barriers that prevent uh, reporting of trafficking. And this includes fear of punishment by traffickers and or state authorities, especially if the activity is an illegal activity. Um, there is often a lack of awareness that a person is being trafficked in the first place. So they're not really able to even seek out their rights and know that reporting is a, um, is a possibility. And many times the victims of trafficking uh, have faced language barriers um, and have restrictions with mobility. During COVID-19, we actually did see these numbers drop, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there are less people being trafficked. Uh, it shows that the impact of the lockdowns, in fact, and that um, the shift to focus on responding to the pandemic rather than addressing trafficking. Some of the gender dimensions of trafficking um, is mostly to do with the, the element of sexual violence here. And you can see with this statistic that um, even though uh, maybe women and girls uh, may be trafficked for another purpose, they usually experience sexual violence as well in its, for example, forced labor. And, we see, and we're seeing also um, the link between um, women and girls being trafficked by, you know, intimate partners or, sexual, or, or family members. Um, it, it's showing here that um, even though most traffickers are men and with women making up only 38%, most of these women from the, from the data from the court cases are often, were often victims of trafficking um, themselves. So, uh, and other just discriminatory and harmful gender norms also play a role in increasing the vulnerability of trafficking for women and girls. For example, um, women and girls are more likely to be trafficked as brides in countries where there is a skewed sex ratio due to the sun preference. Uh, at UN Women, we, we see trafficking as a form of uh, gender-based violence. Um, and gender-based violence is of course rooted in inequality, in gender inequality. The CEDAW committee also recognizes that trafficking in women is uh, uh, considered GBV. Um, this is also, this is to do with this broader culture of male entitlement and social norms related to the control of female sexuality and the acceptance of violence against women and girls. And it's a key underlying, drive, underlying driver of women and girls' vulnerability to trafficking. As we saw in the previous slide, there is where we're understanding more and more the connection between intimate partner violence and trafficking. In fact, studies have found that at least 25% of cases of trafficking survivors were subject to multiple forms of GB, GBV prior to being trafficked. Um, and this, is, this would may probably be higher as there are, um, as GBV is frequently underreported. 
Okay. So this slide shows the multiple layers of vulnerabilities in addition to gender equality that intersect. And when they intersect, uh, it increases the risk of trafficking. Some of these factors include economic insecurity, the lack of viable employment options and poverty are well established as factors that increase in vulnerability to trafficking. We are also seeing that girls do not have equal access to education, particularly in low income countries where families cannot afford to send all their children to school and therefore prefer to send boys. There is a lack of access to gender responsive social protection um, and that is a fact which, which increases um, women's risk to poverty and then therefore vulnerability to trafficking. Um, the impact of crisis exacerbates all of these factors. For example, we see, we've seen this a lot during COVID-19. Research has shown that women and girls experienced greater barriers to accessing support services and public resources were diverted from protecting survivors. We have also seen that trafficking in persons has gone even further underground. Um, with reports at the country and regional level indicating that domestic trafficking is increasing, but it's shifting to the online. Um, and and it particularly, you know, children spending all the time on, on computers and going to school online increased their risks as well. Climate change and armed conflict also increases the risk as it creates mass migration and displacement. We're currently witnessing, as we all see, uh, the war in Ukraine with millions of people fleeing, and most of them are women and girls. In fact, since the start of the war in Ukraine, um, there has also been an increased demand for illicit content and sexual services of Ukrainian women, with searches for pornography related to Ukrainian women increasing by 600%, and searches for Ukrainian women escort services increasing by 200% within months of the invasion. It's a very disturbing um, fact. Women and girls of colour, Indigenous women, those from the LGBT community also face additional risks. And like the speakers have said before, like Tracy said, it is important to note that all people can be trafficked. So these are just some of the factors, but even if you are not fitting into these um, categories, you are still at risk of trafficking. So to talk a little bit about mental health, um, you know, if we recognize that trafficking is gendered, then so too are the mental health impacts. Um, and it, and this all influences. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, this all influences the ability of uh, survivors to reintegrate into the into society. There is often a lot of stigma for women and girls around identifying as survivors of trafficking. And um, we have seen in our work with survivors that um, many of them suffer from post-traumatic stress syndrome, PTSD, and have been seeking treatment for even 20 years after the um, event of trafficking has been experienced. Um, as, as, we, as I've been talking and talking especially a lot about the, the fact that sexual violence is often a a part of a women, a woman and girl's experience of trafficking. These also, this also has an impact um, on mental health. We, in one study, um, it showed that women who were trafficked for sexual exploitation were less stable, more isolated, had greater levels of fear, and greater mental health needs than when compared with other victims of crime. And in another study, 89% of female survivors of sex trafficking experienced depression and 42% had attempted suicide whilst being trafficked. Another impact of the sexual violence is um, unwanted pregnancies and sexually transmitted infections like such as HIV. And this all just points to the, the need to ensure that we have long-term access, uh, sorry, that survivors have access to long-term services so that we prevent uh, re-trafficking or being trafficked, trafficked for the second time because um, it, it, it's reinforcing this cycle of vulnerability. So on to some, some key recommendations and what the uh, UN Women um, aim is, 
is to a gender transformative approach, which it aims to address the root causes uh, of what of the drivers of trafficking, and um, that is gender inequality. And some some key key recommendations include the in, in implementation of survivor centered services that are trauma informed and provide long term support. Working with survivors in particular and, and survivor led organizations and ensuring that they have a voice uh, and that they're part of policy making as well as service delivery. Um, of course, strengthening laws and policies that address violence against women, but also those other factors like education, um, safe migration, um, and economic empowerment. Engaging men and boys uh, is really key to change those harmful ad uh, attitudes and social norms that drive the demand uh, for sexual exploitation and identify groups suffering from intersecting forms of discrimination, such as Indigenous women um, and those from the LGBT com community um, and, other, and other groups. So I will leave it there um, and sh I'll stop sharing, shall I, Tracy? Yes, please. Great. Thank you. And we are going to uh, have a question and answer period at the end. So I'm going to be monitoring the chat box as well as any other comments that folks might have. Um, so thank you very much, Andrea. That was informative. Unfortunately, it, for me, it is 7.20 in the morning. And so I know there are a number of others here who are uh, in Canada or the United States, and it is quite early. It's quite early to be hearing that type of information. It's quite alarming. It's alarming at any time of the day um, to think about some of the stats, to think about domestic trafficking shifting online, et cetera. So it, you know, it's really, there's so much we need to know and so much more we need to learn about this whole experience so that we can address the factors and, and hopefully not only provide support to women and girls and those that are trafficked, but also address the issues for those that are involved and in engaging in trafficking. So thank you, Andrea. Thank you. All right, um, I'm not sure, Porsche. All right, so you did receive that. So next we have Carolina Beretta. And I'm going to read Carolina's uh, bio. Carolina is a senior clinical psychologist with over 15 years of experience working with individuals, couples, families, public, private organizations, government, and NGOs. Carolina is the founder of Emotion Lab Psychology. She is a longstanding, she has a longstanding role as a consultant psychologist for the Salvation Army Trafficking and Slavery Safe House in Sydney, Australia. This role involves developing therapeutic and mentoring interventions for victim survivors of human trafficking, modern slavery, and forced marriage. She also provides consultation and training for the Australian Federal Police. And as a recipient of the Australian Psychological Society Intercultural Grant, Carolina provided training to immigration officials, local police officers, and NGOs in Colombia to better understand psychological components of victim survivor experiences. Carolina is deeply passionate about cross-cultural issues. She focuses on creating integrated, flexible interventions, drawing on a broad range of theoretical and practical techniques, including clinical psychology, family systems therapy, neuroscience, movement, and creative arts therapy. Her mission is to promote a sense of well-being and empowerment to create more meaningful connections and live happier lives. And on that, I turn it over to Carolina. Hi, thank you, Tracy. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm on the other end of the day from Tracy. So it's um, 10, 20 p.m. tonight in, in Sydney, Australia. Um, so I'm gonna try to you know, turn on my brain as much as possible at this time of the night. Um, so uh, when I um, was invited to be part of the, of, of the webinar, uh, the question was, you know, what is the uh, impact of, men, of uh, human trafficking on mental health? And it was actually a really good uh, question because, um, you know, normally I, I get to work with, with the females uh, that come through my clinical practice. Um, and then I, uh, I see a lot of presentations, but I had to think very deeply about what it is 
that I could um, uh, think as the one of the biggest uh, impacts on mental health. So I decided to, uh, uh, for this short period of time that we have today, to focus on one of the uh, most significant impacts that I've observed over the years, and it is uh, something to do with the capacity uh, to trust. Um, and, and so I, I would actually say that one of the uh, 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 long-term uh, impacts is that uh, people who go through these process of human, of, for experiences of human trafficking uh, lose their uh, compass on who they can trust because this normally happens on a relational basis. Um, if we could go through the next slide, that would be great. So human trafficking, um, usually, you know, the exposure to human trafficking occurs in a relational context. Uh, you know, it normally happens uh, through an employer, through a family, through a friend, through an uh, acquaintance, through the community. Um, and, and that uh, means that uh, there are going to be some uh, uh, relationships and it compromises the attachment system in an interrelational process that normally leads to what we call interrelational trauma or complex trauma. Um, there is a, an experience of power differential where there are control and power dynamics that the, the person is usually exposed to. And as a result of, the, of that, uh, trust and boundaries become very blurry and in most cases broken, uh, which uh, leads to people becoming very confused about uh, what it is that they should allow and what it is that they it is expected from them. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. So uh, some of the most clinical, you know, common clinical presentations that we see in, in uh, supporting victims and survivors of human trafficking is that they experience an ongoing sense of fear, sadness and anger. Um, and all of them tend to be unresolved feelings because they are not sure what they must fear anymore. The, the people that they, the, that they trusted to support them to uh, so, uh, you know, uh, achieve their dreams or the ones that were meant to protect them are no longer part of their uh, safety uh, network. Um, so there is a lot of fear. Uh, there is a lot of sadness for the loss uh, of what, what was and what could have been. And there is also a lot of anger that tends to be repressed because it is very uh, paralyzing and very scary for most people to actually tap into uh, the, the emotion of uh, uh, anger that will allow them to, to create boundaries. Um, we also see um, uh, a lot of problems with memory and concentration. It is difficult to, uh, to create new memories because um, uh, the, uh, the victim or the survivor tends to be very much stuck in the experience of human trafficking. Um, there are lots of raising thoughts and constant worry for their, for their safety. Um, as a result of, you know, uh, having uh, escape uh, a, con a situation of human trafficking, there, there is a lot of worry about what will be the consequences on them. And in many cases, what will be the consequences on their family system and their community and, and everything that is linked to them. Um, uh, travel, sleeping, um, uh, sleep becomes very, very disruptive. There is a lot of uh, sense of grief and loss. And um, all of that tends to create a lot of social isolation and loneliness. Uh, the three most common presentations that we see in clinical terms are, um, uh, there's the development of depression, there's the development of uh, anxiety and mood disorders, and there is complex uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, if we could go through the next slide, that would be good. Thank you. So um, if, you know, all, all of those clinical presentations uh, have one big uh, uh, core, which is uh, what we could call a, a, a loss of sense of self, you know, uh, the, the person 
uh, loses in some ways their capacity to 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 hold their their, their self together and there is a lot of uh, uh, hopelessness uh, desperation anguish sadness and the capacity to function becomes highly compromised and there is also a very big loss for the sense of joy um, that it's directly linked to the shame and the confusion of why uh, they are in the situation that they end up being. Um, next slide, please. So um, if, if we could uh, somehow, you know, summarize, this is obviously, a, as you can see in the slide, a quite dynamic process um, where we see initially the person experiences a very big loss of sense of safety. Um, they don't know exactly where it feels safe because uh, if we keep in mind that you know uh, human trafficking occurs in these uh, relational contexts, uh, most of the time, you know, there, as as Andrea was already explaining, they are uh, in a position of vulnerability, and most of the time, uh, the experience of human trafficking occurs because they are looking for uh, a, a new sense of safety or for a way of feeling safer and changing the conditions in which they are uh, living. But what they tend to find is that they go into the, you know, they, they end up having the opposite experience, which is there is very little safety and they are no longer able to identify what it is that feels safe and where safety uh, is. Uh, the other aspect that becomes highly compromised is their capacity to understand boundaries. Um, you know, they, they become very blurry. Uh, uh, it is quite uh, difficult for victims and survivors of human trafficking to identify that um, or, or to give themselves permission to uh, follow their boundaries and what they start noticing that doesn't feel right or doesn't uh, uh, fit with uh, a sense of respect. Uh, so as a result of that, trust is, is one of the things that becomes really, really uh, difficult for them to start um, uh, uh, having, you know, they, they don't know what to trust, they don't know when to trust, and they don't know who to trust. And that includes um, uh, professionals also that, that, that come to support uh, uh, the, the victims, um, it, it takes uh, a long time for some of them to really understand that um, after the experience of being betrayed uh, or being, you know, uh, exposed to um, violence, um, they, uh, they now can trust a group of people that are supporting and, 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 and one of the things that we see the most uh, in, in some people is that they they actually don't even know if the health professionals are on their side or if there is going to be some kind of uh, uh, repercussion or some kind of uh, price that they're going to have to pay to access the services. Um, we also see there there is a huge loss of uh, their resources. Uh, in some cases those resources are their family system, in some cases is their community, in some cases is their culture, um, uh, the practices. Uh, there is a huge loss of the dreams and goals that, that they, they, they had. Um, and there is a, a loss of identity as well. It, it becomes very confusing for them uh, to understand who they are and where they belong and who they belong with. And there is a massive disruption of developmental tasks and milestones um, because uh, there is a huge part of um, the process uh, uh, leads them to be in, 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 a, in a state of crisis for a long time. So all of those tasks, normative tasks that uh, will be um, taking place become very disrupted and in some cases quite stagnant. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? 
So um, I, I thought that maybe I would just do a very, very, very brief, you know, um, illustration of how this uh, uh, happens in in some people. So we're gonna use, we're gonna call uh, this case Jane's case, and and this is a, a case uh, of a sixteen year old um, girl who managed to escape uh, forced marriage. Um, uh, because of the nature of forced marriage, um, the place that normally would have been deemed as a safe place, which was home and family, uh, became unsafe for her and her family system uh, went from being a place of safety to a, a place of threat. Uh, as a result of that, uh, Jen uh, left her home um, and she uh, had to, for safety reasons, had to stop contact with her family. Um, and then gradually she had to stop um, talking also and lose contact with not just her family, uh, immediate family, uh, nuclear family, but also her extended family, her friends and, um, and, and her community. Uh, Jens, uh, as a result of that, she had to move to a youth refuge and started, um, uh, had to start developing uh, uh, independent skills quite quickly, which is a very abrupt change uh, coming from, um, you know, a family system where the collective is um, a priority and then suddenly having to become an individual that that requires to be fully in charge of her own finances and education uh, and uh, health. Um, and making very, very, very big and serious decisions such as um, uh, in, uh, pressing charges against um, uh, her family or community members at the age of 16. Um, if we could go to the next slide, that would be good, please. Um, so, uh, I, I understand, you know, like, I mean, I'd love to give you much more details of Jen's case, but. Um, uh, with that big picture, um, what we see in cases like hers is that um, there is a big part of uh, the, the journey that is on survival mode. So all of those, uh, you know, uh, normative tasks like education, um, uh, development of social skills with, uh, with peers become completely stagnant. Um, uh, there is a disruption of, of those goals. Um, uh, a person like Jen, like Jen would um, have very limited resources, external resources, because the majority of her resources would have been uh, connected to her family system and her community. So now those resources are no longer there and she will have to create new, um, uh, find new resources and also create uh, new internal resources and psychological coping mechanisms that probably have never been tested before uh, uh, at, to the same uh, level. Um, as I already said, developmental tasks as, as, such as dating, establishing strong bonds with peers, I highly disrupted. Uh, they experienced a lot of financial hardship um, as we could imagine, you know, a 16 year old uh, girl that leaves her home uh, wouldn't really have much of a, 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 a financial backup and also very, in most cases, very limited um, skills to be able to, to make money. Um, as a result of that experience, there is a high uh, fear, you know, to to trust and to know who is who is the good cop and who is the bad cop in their lives. Um, uh, there's a very confusing concept of boundaries as well. Um, uh, there is an accelerated and premature level of responsibility and self-reliance that later on, you know, in, in later years uh, could also become an issue for their uh, development of psychological uh, coping mechanisms. And the educational process um, becomes stagnant and in most cases, you know, disrupted. Um, next slide, please. So um, I, I guess, you know, uh, just to, it sounds of course, you know, like very, very, um, painful, you know, to think that uh, we have uh, young people going through such a, a difficult experience. And, and I just thought that um, to wrap up, we, you know, I would um, 
give a little bit of an insight into what you know how we deal with this and basically what we do is we focus a lot on restoring uh, the sense of safety and the sense of self um, and and this applies not just for cases like Jen when you know they are young people but also to every person that has come through the program um, no matter how old they are um, uh, we f we do a lot of work on um, uh, almost like you know we I, I like to call it get the, the, the person to feel their bonds again and to and to tap into that internal structure that allows them to feel that they are there for themselves and that they are um, a, full of capacities and strengths that are going to be to the service of, of um, bouncing back from the experience. We do a lot of work on development of healthy boundaries, um, development of strengths and skills, a lot of work on self-acceptance, self-compassion, self-expression, um, uh, also uh, identification of resources and creation of new resources. Uh, an integration of their identity, you know, the previous identity, what they used to be and what they are now. Um, a lot of uh, work on um, synchronicity with others and learning to uh, connect to others from a place of attunement uh, rather than from a place of a power control dynamic. Um, and uh, with that, you know, aiming to, for them to recognize the importance of making decisions uh, that are going to give them access to a sense of well-being, vitality and growth. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. Maybe if we check, um, I think that, that must be my last slide. Yes, I think that's it. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Again, so much information for us to digest. And I appreciate, I didn't say this at the beginning, but for all the guest speakers, we on the organizing committee appreciate that we have given you a massive task to talk about human trafficking in 15 to 20 minutes. And we know that that is, that is almost impossible, but so far, thank you to both of you for doing that, for taking on that challenge. As you were, as you were talking, I was taking down some notes and thinking about, you know, you mentioned some of the, um, some of the factors, some of the experiences, some of the presenting um, behaviors that those that have been involved with human trafficking experience. And it's really important for those of us that work with people in general, those of us that work with those that have been trafficked to understand what some of the common expressions are, to know that that is somewhat normal for a person who has been trafficked. If we don't understand that, we can be reacting to their behaviors and, and not understand where they're coming from. So it's very important that we understand what some of the common expressions are, though also appreciate that some others may also appear. They may be individual to the person, they may be common to them over a long period of time, and we have to, as our role, understand who the person is in front of us. Not just define them by being a victim of human trafficking, but also understand them as a person and their experiences. I'm, I'm pleased that you talked about um, helping folks, helping women, girls, and those that have experienced this to restore a sense of safety and a sense of self. If I can just briefly tell a story, um, a woman in Winnipeg, the, the city that I'm from, has shared her experiences with human trafficking. And at the age of 13, 14, it was very simple. She was at her local school. She was walking through the mall that was very close to the school. She and a group of other girls, this young lady was having difficulties at home. And I guess it showed on her face. It showed on her behavior. She looked very sad. And as this group of young girls walked past a group of men who were sitting at a table in the local mall, one of the men picked up on that and said to her, you don't, you don't look okay. Is everything okay at home? She engaged with him initially. And then over a period of time, he kept engaging with this young girl and then invited her to a party at his home. It was very innocent in her mind. She had no idea what was coming. Needless to say, he kidnapped her and trafficked her across provincial borders over a number of years. And she tells her story at how at the age of now 35 and a mother, she still has difficulty when her young daughter comes and gives her a hug. She recoils. She doesn't trust 
She doesn't have that bond that she would like to have. She appreciates that she should be different, but it's a long standing experience and a long process to recover from that. So thank you for yes. sharing your comments. Yes, yes. I think, I think, that, I think that that's, uh, you know, uh, you're very spot on when you think about the, 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 the long-term um, consequences. So thanks for that. You're very welcome. Thank you. All right. Now I'm looking at our next presenter. Our next presenter is not joining us in person. Um, Jennifer Jean is a poet. Actually, I'll just back up and say the webinar organizing committee made the decision to invite guest speakers to talk about a topic, but also an artist, invite an artist of some kind, whether it's a singer, a songwriter, a drummer, a dancer, or in this case, a poet. Now, I'm looking here, we had originally lined up to have the poem read. I'm not sure if we have that at the moment but I will introduce the poet that we were going to, to share with you today. So Jennifer Jean is a poet, a translator, an editor, and an educator. Her ancestors are from the Cape Verde Islands, if I'm saying that correctly. She was born in Venice, California, and lived in foster care until she was seven. Her book, Object Lesson of 2021, explores objectification and human trafficking in the United States. Her poems, prose, and co-translations have appeared in many journals, magazines, and poetry collections, and she has been awarded several fellowships. She received an Ambassador for Peace Award from the Women's Federation for World Peace. Now, as I read that, I'm going to connect with Porsche and ask, do we have, it appears we may not have the two slides for the poem. The poem is titled Bird. I encourage you all to Google Jennifer Jean and the poem Bird. It's a, it's a poem about human trafficking and that experience. So if we are able to bring the link to the poem up during this webinar, we will do so. Otherwise, I encourage you to again, Google Jennifer Jean and her poem Bird. All right, on that note, I think we will now turn it over to Joy Smith. I'm going to close my chat here for a quick moment. There we go. All right. Joy Smith is a colleague from Winnipeg, I'm excited to say. Joy Smith holds a bachelor degree and a master's degree in education and was a teacher for 23 years. She was elected to parliament in 2004. As a member of parliament, she passed a private member's motion, M153, which called on parliament to condemn trafficking across international borders. She made Canadian history by being the only member of parliament since Confederation who passed two private member bills that were placed in the Criminal Code of Canada. Not one, but two. She passed Bill C-268, mandatory minimums for traffickers of children 18 years and younger, and Bill C-310, which ensures that Canadian predators that are trafficking in other countries will be brought back to Canada for justice. In 2011, she founded the Joy Smith Foundation, where she tirelessly volunteers her time combating human trafficking and fighting for the rights of women in Canada and around the globe. On that note, I turn it over to Joy. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate that. We're going to put our slides up right now and uh, be very careful with the time. I have to thank the presenters who went before me. It was wonderful to hear that because when I started on the human trafficking issue 25 years ago, no one talked about it. And it was the laws, I think, that really helped the survivors come forward and tell their stories. And I have to credit the survivors of human trafficking who stood with me in Parliament when nobody else would. And they told their stories, these brave women who told their stories. And so now I'm writing a book about the survivors themselves, because I think they're the ones that really helped Canada and, and the world know about human trafficking, because in Canada, no one was addressing it at all. And so I worked very closely with the US and with the, the UK on many of these issues um, throughout the years. So thank you to the presenters and thank you to everybody who is really taking an interest in the issue of human trafficking and doing something about it. Um, 
human trafficking happens every day. And um, we talked a little bit about um, the foundation, but what we've launched now is the Human Trafficking Education Center. And we raise money. I get no money from my foundation at all, but we raise money to put free education up for everybody, for all of Canada, all of the United States, anyone who wants to see it about human trafficking. And we have two programs. We have the intervention program and the prevention program. So that information is so important for everyone. Today, we're talking about the mental health of, of traffic victims. You know, I was very moved. I have so many stories. We have so many stories. We've worked over 7,000 cases over 25 years of victims of human trafficking. And we've, we've monitored what their behaviors are. And everybody that supports survivors of human trafficking is an important person in their lives. So after someone is being trafficked, if they're fortunate enough to get out of it, and we have done a lot of rescues, we've helped a lot of girls, they have uh, trauma-related behaviors that uh, often when they get back into their families, the families don't understand that. And so they don't know the girl who came back home is different from the girl who was trafficked and left. And so we work with whole families on, on that. Often, um, you know, the behaviors that they display is, is display is not uh, understood by the family. So initially, when they first come back, they welcome them in. And then afterwards, after about two or three weeks, they don't want them home anymore. And so this destroys the whole family once again. And what was previously talked about trust and, and all the things um, that were uh, outlined by the previous speaker, she's so right like that lack of trust, that lack of well-being, all those are trauma behaviors that are embedded um, in the survivor's brain. We've worked with um, many of the Nygaard uh, survivors. Uh, it's a, a case we've had here in Canada where a very high-profile businessman uh, was a trafficker, and, and it's very well known, so I can speak about that. But also the post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. I mean, they do, they all display it. And so when we bring them in into our intervention program, we explain not only to the survivor, but to, to those close to them, whether it be family or friend, but someone who's supporting them, someone who'll stick with them about what's really happened in their brains. And Professor Gail Dines from uh, the University of Boston is one of the foremost experts on trauma-related uh, behaviors, post-traumatic stress, and Stockholm Syndrome. And, um, you know, often when um, the mental health of a traffic victim and is not addressed, not only with them or with their families or those close to them, they don't have the support systems to, to have the wherewithal to be empowered to carry on with their lives. And I have to say, we've had many like Virginia, who's now taking her master's degree. And uh, she had four children from men she didn't even know, but she raised those children, we helped her. And over time, uh, she is a success story. But even with that success story, as was mentioned earlier, they have these long reaching uh, mental trauma behaviors, post-traumatic stress and Stockholm syndrome. And it's very curious uh, why uh, a victim sometimes will go back to her trafficker. And they usually do that because they don't have those support systems. They don't have the family or the friends or someone behind them to, to help them get through their trauma. That is why um, we um, launched the National Human Trafficking Education Center right here in Canada. And so we work through in our prevention program and in our intervention program, we work through these things because in real life, survivors need the counseling. We refer people to very professional counselors who have experience in this if they need that after we work in the intervention program. But I have to say that human trafficking victims all display trauma behaviors, all display PTSD and Stockholm Syndrome. And Stockholm Syndrome is very misunderstood 
because a lot of people wonder how could they go back to that horrendously horrific experience while they go back to the trafficker and that's a Stockholm syndrome and you see that in in cases where someone is kidnapped and you wonder why sometimes they'll have connections with their kidnappers because their brain has changed like when you go through trauma the pathways in your brain actually change until you've had the uh, we don't have time to go through it now and to demonstrate it but the fact of the matter is that counseling that support that love helps them to heal in a major way so as was mentioned before the effect of human trafficking on mental health is horrendous and long long lasting uh, without those supports and you know the practical things like like having a safe place to live like being able to see a vision for the future to help them with their education uh, that is all empowerment practices that help offset the effects that survivors often experience on their mental health you know the instinctive mistrust of everyone even their caregivers um, is something um, that is systemic to uh, how they operate every single day memory loss some of them will actually forget some of the trauma experiences until they start to relax and it'll come back to them uh, the avoidance of reminders and triggers irritability depression you know very hyper vigilance they watch everything around them you talk to a survivor they will see what happens on the street but without where the ordinary person will not notice little things and they're often emotionally numb often when someone um, a traffic victim uh, later on genuinely falls in love with a good person um, who really loves them they're sometimes emotionally numb um, what um, Tracy was saying about that that woman who you know just couldn't get a hug from her daughter without recoiling it's the emotional numbness and in our intervention program we talk about that all the time and when we go into schools in our prevention program when we talk to youth we talk about what happens after someone is trafficked because the traffickers paint a wonderful picture we were dealing with a young girl just last week she was going to go and she was going to be a prostitute because she was going to live in a big house and the gang had already groomed her really well and it's all a big lie you know once she gets out from under the protection of her parents and her parents are wonderful but the influence of, of outside influences on young people is really really very profound and it's not necessarily that they're unhappy at home I know we always hear they're unhappy at home but we've worked over 7,000 cases and we have the files and they come traffic victims come from very very good homes as well this young girl was 14 years old and the, the gang had groomed her she got into a gang but with a girlfriend and they're a human trafficking gang there's no doubt about it and she's groomed and convinced that her life her she's in love with her boyfriend and her life will be lovely for the rest of her rest of her days and that comes from a family we had the mom and the dad the dad couldn't stop crying talking about his daughter so you know every day we work with survivors who you know it breaks our hearts to see how influenced young people can be we spend a long time in our prevention program we work with police officers we work with psychologists we're working with lawyers the prosecution um, dealing with you know how they get um, success in a courtroom we work with judges and all of those things that we put on the national human trafficking education center can't be seen uh, to the regular person but they can see things like what parents should know about human trafficking and we've got five more that are going up very soon because we put all this information up there for free to help everybody because it takes a nation it takes a world to stop human trafficking so one thing we've found that's consistent um, 
the in in survivors of human trafficking and their in, in their mental health is they believe that no one can really understand them if someone else isn't trafficked they don't know um, what's really happening to them and that's not true um, we have peer groups um, with survivors of human trafficking we have a survivor right now that is working in our work program where you know a lot of these uh, victims um, don't have the education they miss a lot of their education so we help them uh, you know we help them steer them into scholarships steer them into support systems but also we have work programs we have two business programs where we have a, a former survivor of human trafficking that went through um, very formal training on nails and hair and things like that. And now she's training other survivors. And we have a florist who is uh, teaching them how to build a florist business where they can learn arrangements and things like that. Very practical things. Because remember, a lot of these survivors have been they're dealing with a whole lot of things, but they need to earn a living. They need to be empowered to take care of themselves. And, you know, the belief also that they deserve the abuse. It's its its horrible uh, how they almost blame them. They don't almost, they, they blame themselves. And when we work with survivors, we say, you know, it's not your fault. And we explain to them how traffickers work. And the goal is always to empower the survivors. So they do, survivors need many supports. They need to be retrained. They need to be counseled and peer group supports, uh, to name three of them, that we find very, very important for them. Um, I think that helping survivors heal is a long process. It's a lifelong process. And it's like eating an elephant with a spoon, I think, you know, <laughs> spoon by spoon. I have to say that it's step by step and never give up. And so we have had many success stories with survivors, but we've also had many success stories in preventing human trafficking from happening because that education, we believe education is our greatest weapon, and we've done a lot of rescues and still continue to all across our all across our country. So survivors need to be reassured that they're never alone. And they need someone who's always available to them until they feel independent and want to be on their own. So this independent happens after they become empowered, whether it's getting education or a new job or even starting to care for themselves and their children. That's why we have this workplace program that we're putting in all across Canada. And, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt, I have to share this with you. I know um, I read the poem that was sent to us um, um, by, um, by the poet, and it was very moving. But, you know, something I want to leave with you, um, I always tell the, the survivors, it's more intelligent to hope rather than to fear, to try rather than to not to try. For one thing we know above all doubt, nothing has ever been achieved by the person who says it can't be done. And I always tell the survivors that. So I say, you don't know what you can do. And then in the peer groups, I bring some of the survivors in that, that have been very successful and... You know, the trauma that they go through, I won't even go through it right now because my time is up. I've been watching the clock. I'm a former parliamentarian, so I know they cut the microphone off at the end of your time. But um, I want to applaud everybody on this seminar today. You are amazing. We love you. We are so grateful you're working on this issue of human trafficking. And I would especially like to thank Tracy Bone for all the work you've put into this uh, today. Education is our greatest weapon and you're right in the hub of education, Tracy. And being a former teacher for 23 years, you know, I have my master's degree in it. I want to be a principal of a school. But you know what? I'm still teaching in a different way. And um, it's been a lot of years. It's 25 years last December. So we're going into our 26th year. So thank you. It takes a nation. It takes the world to stop human trafficking. Well, thank you, Joy. Thank you for your presentation. And thank you for your very kind words. I must say that um, 
yes, I've been involved and I am the face of the webinar at the moment, but there certainly has been a committee that has worked very hard on this and our other webinars as well. So I want to acknowledge them. Um, you know, you made many important comments and many important points throughout as well. One of the things, um, as I as I think about one of your slides, actually, you were talking about the survivors. And often we will talk about survivors or we talk about human trafficking in general, and we'll show a photo, for example, of a woman who is, you know, covering her face or crying or is, is looking distraught as we would understand that they would be. However, I'm very pleased that you chose to show a photo of someone who's smiling. And, and what I learned or what I get from that is that there is opportunity for, for a new life beyond the trafficking. Now, not everyone has, you know, a, a rose at the end of, the, of their experiences. Not everyone has a positive experience at the end. However, it is possible. And, I, and between yourself and the other guest speakers as well, talking about some of that, that is very important. And, and the poem that you just cited, the quote you just cited rather, um, I think that's very important as well to help individuals see that, yes, this is their moment now, but this doesn't have to be their defining or only moment. They can move beyond that and it, it will take much, much work. It will take a great deal of time and intervention, but hopefully most folks can see that. And the word empowerment. Empowerment is just so important when we think about working with survivors of human trafficking. So thank you so much, Joy. All right, now I see that we have quite a bit of activity in our chat box and I do want to acknowledge, let me go here, one person was kind enough to share the link to the poem. So thank you very much for doing that. Sorry, I'm just scrolling now. Um, it was Yvonne, thank you for sharing the link for the poem. I will ask, again, if you have any questions for any particular speaker, if you could please use the chat box and I will be scrolling through. If you have a question for a specific guest speaker, if you could please indicate that so that I can direct the question accordingly. Um, so I do see some questions here. And again, thank you for those who have shared what country or place you are coming to us from, because that's very important for us. As you know, this is an international organization. We have myself from Canada. We have Ingrid from South Africa. Julie is from Australia. Porsche is from Singapore. We have Bridget from South Africa as well, from Cape Town. Um, we have Nancy from New York. We have Ricky from uh, the United States, from New York is, oh, it's not New York. Um, and actually, Ricky posted where exactly she's from. Massachusetts. In the state. Sorry? Sorry, Julie, I missed that. Massachusetts. Massachusetts, right. Um, so it's very exciting to see where other people are from as well. So, all right, I think we will move now on to our final guest speaker. And then I'm going to close my chat box. We're going to move to our final guest speaker, Rachel Lloyd. Rachel is the founder and CEO of Girls Educational and Mentoring Services. As a survivor of commercial sexual exploitation herself, Ms. Lloyd started GEMS in 1998 with a groundbreaking vision to provide survivor-led services specifically to low-income girls and young women of color who had experienced commercial sexual exploitation to raise awareness of the issues and to radically change people's perceptions of girls and women who were victims of commercial sexual exploitation, and to empower a generation of survivor leaders who would be at the forefront of policymaking, advocacy, and services. Rachel's accomplishments include her nationally acclaimed memoir, Girls Like Us, and co-executive producing the groundbreaking Showtime documentary, Very Young Girls that have been viewed by over 5 million people. Rachel has received many local, national, and global awards, including the international and prestigious Reebok Human Rights and World's Children's Awards. Rachel received her bachelor's in psychology from Marymount Manhattan College and master's in applied urban anthropology from the City College of New York. I turn it now over to Rachel. And Rachel, are you there? Yes, sorry, taking one second to uh, bring stuff back on. Um, uh, 
Welcome, welcome. Uh, it's uh, exciting to uh, be here and to be sharing um, this opportunity with uh, some really great folks and just seeing how many people have uh, tuned in from all over the world. It's really uh, a pleasure. Um, I'm, I'm happy to be going last because um, uh, I... I realize like what I kind of want to say is like the tail end of some of what the other folks have talked about. And so there's a couple of uh, points that I kind of want to uh, reiterate from what folks have said. Um, and then I'll talk about kind of the, the survivor perspective as well. Um, I think it's important. And I think uh, Carolina noted, like it, it's important to kind of recognize that the trauma that folks experience is not just limited to trafficking, right? It is not just the trafficking that impacts uh, survivors. Um, we know that the overwhelming majority of survivors, while well, there are indeed survivors, uh, as, as Joy just noticed, noted, who come from uh, stable and loving homes. Uh, overwhelmingly, what we know is that folks have trauma prior uh, and childhood trauma very specifically. And that might not be necessarily from uh, abuse. Um, it can be from grief, it could, from, from bereavement. It can be from, you know, losing your home at an early age, being in a fire. I mean, there's all kinds of things that happen to children. It can be from war. It can be from uh, being a refugee, right? I mean, there's all kinds of displacement, uh, separation, abandonment. I mean, all those kind of things that can impact children. And so, by the time that they are exploited, by the time even adults are exploited, there has often been 10, 15, 20 plus years of uh, not just a traumatic experience, but right, what we now talk about as complex PTSD and not just PTSD, but complex PTSD. And I would encourage folks, uh, we don't have time to do that right now, um, but I would encourage folks, if you're not familiar with the differences between PTSD and complex PTSD, to definitely attend a training, go on Google. Uh, there are some distinct additional elements. And I think, uh, you know, the Carolina talked about kind of the trust aspect, uh, which for, for victims of complex PTSD is really, really kind of paramount. But there are, there are definitely some, some additional uh, things that are worth noting. Um, so recognizing that, you know, for sometimes I, I've seen organizations that are so focused on the trafficking element of someone's experience and their lived experience that they neglect to include or to, to, to identify the 15 years prior that for the young person might actually be more traumatic. Uh, and more long lasting in terms of its impact than the year, two years, three years, whatever that they spent uh, as a trafficking victim. And so it's important that, you know, we, we recognize number one, that survivors are not a monolith. Uh, there is no one single experience. We have shared experiences. There are definitely, you know, commonalities. Um, and we can say that there are, you know, 90% of this and 80% of that. Um, but that doesn't include for the individual elements. And so, right, I would, I would be, uh, you know, in, in, uh, been doing this for uh, a number of years and I, I would be loath to say that there is any one, you know, thing that cuts across every single survivor. Um, so making sure that we're not kind of coming in with our own preconceived idea of what somebody's experience or what somebody's trauma looks like, what somebody's trauma experience is going to be like, what their recovery is going to look like, I think is really critical. Um, that said, from, from just our own work at GEMS, uh, we generally don't pronounce the acronym, we pronounce it as the, the whole word. So at, at GEMS, uh, Girls Educational Mentoring Services, um, we work primarily in, and I, we founded GEMS, I founded GEMS in 1998, um, primarily to work with what I was seeing in New York, which was low-income girls and young women of color uh, who were overwhelmingly being incarcerated often as children, very young children, 12, 13 years old, um, 
who were being completely ignored by uh, traditional social services, who were being stigmatized, who were being blamed, who were being criminalized. Uh, and at that point, um, you know, the, the word trafficking wasn't really in the lexicon. Uh, it was commercial sexual exploitation, but that was only kind of globally that that was kind of uh, permeating. Um, trafficking didn't really come in for another couple of years. Uh, and in the US, nobody was using the term commercial sexual exploitation. I can, I can promise you that. Uh, and so when I was working with, you know, young people in, in the jails and detention centers and on the streets, I mean, the best word that they were being called was what we now call it, gems, the P word, prostitute. Um, and, and I think one of the, the critical pieces of this work has been kind of you know, shifting language and shifting perception um, and recognizing that it's not just the experience that survivors have with trauma and with uh, recovery and healing isn't just the internal piece, but it's the stigma and the way that they are treated within, we are treated within society and those experiences kind of post uh, with family, with community, with law enforcement, with social service providers, with uh, therapists, with, I mean, medical professionals. Uh, I mean, I could do a day just on like bad uh, experiences with medical professionals for survivors. Um, and so recognizing that, you know, we can create, we know that, that for individuals who could experience sexual assault, um, their recovery uh, and healing looks dramatically different if they get the support and resources and ongoing validation that they need. It wasn't your fault, it wasn't your fault, it wasn't your fault, it wasn't your fault. Uh, when they don't get that, um, which is unfortunately what traditionally survivors of, of trafficking haven't gotten, uh, when they are blamed, when they're stigmatized, when they're told that they made choices, that they it was their fault that they made, you know, bad decisions, all of those kind of things. That's when, right, we begin to internalize it and hold on to it. And it makes it so much harder to begin kind of the healing work. So survivors' experiences of trauma and healing and recovery are also incredibly dependent on us as a society, on the systems that we create, on the support, on the way that we frame them. I mean, I, 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 I'm glad, uh, Tracy, that you brought up the, um, the kind of, you know, tearful, sad uh, pictures. I, I think it's, it's been a real challenge. It's a real challenge as a survivor to kind of constantly see that imagery like depicted of yourself, uh, of that's what the expectation of your experience has been. And so whilst in you know, the last 25, 26 years, we've come a long way in terms of, you know, I mean, not criminalizing primarily uh, children and young people uh, who have been uh, arrested for, for uh, being in the sex industry, we're still in many places criminalizing adult women, unfortunately. Um, we have come a long way in, in changing language and, and talking about kind of victims, survivors, commercial sexual exploitation, trafficking, uh, talking about if you were exploited, if you were trafficked, it's something that happened to you. It is part of, it's not who you are, it is something that is happened to you and therefore you can heal from and recover from. It's not a it's not part of your identity. And that is really critical for us to constantly, uh, you know, make sure that we are teaching other people in the community, media, you know, kind of anywhere that we can, but also individually with survivors too, because survivors come into programs holding on to so much shame uh, and so much self-blame. And we'll, we'll say, at 12, I made a choice. Uh, and so, right, oh no, I, 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 I had everything I needed at home, I just decided to go. And so, right, being able to break that down and saying, well, 
your brain hasn't stopped developing and it won't stop developing for, oh, about another 13 years, um, right? That's, we, we know that that's true. We know that brain development uh, and just emotional maturity, right? Adolescent development, all of those things, child development means that children can't make the same decisions that adults can make. And even when we're talking about adults who end up in the sex industry, uh, we are very rarely talking about adults who haven't experienced severe childhood trauma uh, or who didn't get introduced to the commercial sex industry at a much earlier age. Um, you know, I think there is, there is currently a kind of uh, very strong resurgence of the kind of uh, pro-sex work movement of the, the kind of 80s uh, that is promoting this idea that it is, you know, all choice based and it is empowerment based. Uh, and and that the two things are very different, the trafficking and the sex industry or sex work are two very different things. And what we know from our work is just pieces along the continuum. Uh, it, not to say again, that there aren't individuals with a master's degree who one day at the age of 30 decide to go into the sex industry. I will say, as I'm sure most of you will say, that's not been our experience. Uh, that's not really representative of billions, uh, of millions of, of, of women, children, trans youth, trans adults, uh, non-binary youth, uh, right, boys, young men around the world for whom this experience is about lack of choices. It's not about choice. It's about desperation. It's not about uh, feeling like you have multiple options from which to choose from. Uh, and when all of your options feel bad, um, when it's, can I eat today or shall I end up in the sex industry? Shall I run away from home where I'm being sexually abused or shall I go to this guy who's offering me, right? Sometimes the, 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 indus the sex industry can seem the more appealing option uh, because you don't know what is to come. Uh, so I think just, just making sure that as a community and as a society, we are constantly being vigilant about the way that we talk about survivors, the way that we present uh, survivors' experiences, the fact that we need to make sure, and GEMS has always, you know, the, the point of GEMS was really uh, creating a space that was for us, by us, and that would promote the, the leadership of survivors and survivors' experiences, survivors' expertise, survivors' voices, uh, and, and making sure that it wasn't a tokenized thing, um, that survivors weren't invited, uh, and I, I, that's not why I was invited today, and I appreciate that, right, that survivors weren't invited, you know, to a panel to make everybody cry, which often we see now, and so that's the thing, we've come We've come away from like the whole making, uh, you know, criminalizing survivors, but now we're doing some really other harmful things with good intent, uh, but sometimes impact, uh, we have to, you know, weigh impact against intent and the impact on survivors ongoing well-being can be to re-traumatize survivors over and over again. Uh, if survivors employment is based upon their willingness uh, to share their story over and over again, if their economic well-being, if they're like a you know public speaker, but they know they're only getting invited to keep saying their story over and over again. You do it because you don't have other choices, uh, but that doesn't mean that it isn't re-triggering, re-traumatizing and bringing up all those issues. And, and we want to make sure that we are whilst in, I would agree with, right? Like, I mean, the, the depiction and the, uh, you know, the discussions of, of long-term trauma. And as I said, the, the prior trauma uh, is often, is almost always, but often long-term prior to the entry into the commercial sex industry. Uh, then you've got your years, months, whatever, being trafficked and then you've got the period after that and so yeah there's a lot of years in there and that takes a lot of healing and that's an ongoing process and so services have to be long term and what we see is a lot of services that are very aimed at that initial victim stage uh but not a lot of services that are about the long-term ongoing support where people 
can come back in uh, even if the issue that they're having isn't specific to trafficking, but they can come back in five years later and say, hey, I know I said I didn't need therapy a few years ago, but now, now I've got some stability. Now I've, you know, I've got housing and I've got a job. I'm finally having that moment of like, oh my God, this stuff is kicking up for me. I'm, I'm experiencing trauma. And it can be people coming back in to say, hey, I... I don't have anybody to help me figure out how to get an apartment, how to get a, do a resume, how to, I'm, I'm a young adult or I'm, you know, an adult uh, who didn't get to do any of those things and I don't have family support and I need a space of supportive adults who have good, my good, my best interests at heart, who are going to support me in that. Uh, and so making sure that we are creating, even if you're not able to do it in your specific agency, if you, or if you're a hospital or if you're a, a, a clinic or, or somewhere that is very time specific, making sure that within our communities, we create continuums of long-term care and long-term support and that what we provide survivors uh, at various stages looks different than what they need initially, um, right? We are not, we don't need to be wrapped in cotton for the rest of our lives and stuck in a corner, right? We're not glass. Uh, we need opportunities to be heard. We need opportunities to, you know, as, uh, as Carolina was saying, self-expression, um, right? That the genuine empowerment, um, you know, as opposed to kind of uh, token empowerment. Um, and, and the opportunity to be financially independent, to develop genuine economic independence. And that comes through education, that comes through employment training, uh, through, you know, ongoing uh, support. One of the, the big issues that we have found uh, and have been doing since we started has been kind of direct cash transfers and conditional cash transfers and how critical providing income is to the young people that we serve. Um, and so, you know, I, I think I've, obviously there's a, there's a ton to say on this issue, but I, I think making sure that we are, we are not painting pictures of perpetual doom and gloom uh, for ourselves as providers um, or for the survivors that we work with. If we think that the best option or the best future that people are gonna get um, it's like, eh, you're not going to cry as much, uh, right? That's that's not a that's not a a really encouraging um, future, uh, and it's and and recognizing that you know, as long as there is life, there is still hope. As long as people are still breathing, there is still the capacity to change uh, and heal and grow and severe trauma can coexist with incredible resiliency at the same time. Um, and go ahead. So Rachel, um, I, I, don't, I apologize for stopping you there. However, we are running out of time and we have Ingrid Daniels has to do a wrap up to the webinar. So again, I apologize. Thank you so much for your thoughts and your comments. And, you know, it's interesting how powerful a presentation can be without PowerPoints. We do not need to have a PowerPoint presentation in order to get our points across. So thank you very much for sharing your thoughts and, and your experiences, as well as your, your comments about thinking for the future as well. So thank you so much for that. Um, we do have about three or four minutes left. Um, I do wanna thank everyone who has posted within the chat about where you're coming from. Thank you very much. It's very exciting to see that. I do have I'm going to close my chat box again. Before I turn it over to Ingrid, we do, I do have two slides. Uh, let me bring that one up. I'm going to share my own slide here. One slide is to simply indicate that we do have a link to a survey. This is an evaluation survey of this particular webinar. The link is at the bottom there. And I've asked Porsche if she could please copy the link and put it into the chat box. Um, we really encourage you to complete the survey. It takes mere minutes, three to four minutes. And it really helps us in terms of our planning, where we're going, topics that we want to think about moving forward. So we want to meet the needs of those that are participating and attending our webinars. So if you could please share your thoughts that way. 
We also have a final slide here if you're interested in becoming informed of future webinars and activities of the Women's Mental Health section, please contact Nancy Wallace. This is her, her email address as well as her telephone. We're, if you're interested in becoming a member of the World Federation as well, we encourage you to do that. There is a link at the bottom. So on that note, I'm going to rather abruptly turn it over to Ingrid Daniels, who will share closing comments. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, or I should rather say good day because it's afternoon in South, in South Africa. I've got a huge task to wrap up such incredible presentations in five minutes. But I have to say, and you have to agree with me, that the, the presentations have given us incredible insight, knowledge, and information. But over and above those, you've given us recommendations as well to address the impact of human traffic, trafficking on girl children and women's mental health. A topic that leaves us deeply affected, emotionally stirred, but challenged to intervene and ensure that these issues are addressed. Andrea De Silva addressed the vulnerabilities of women and girl children in traffic, trafficking and the specific impact on their mental health. She presented us with some alarming statistics and I just want to draw out two of those. Women and girls represent 92% of victims trafficked for sexual exploitation, the most prominent form. 98% of women and girls are subject, subjected to forced labor and have experienced sexual violence. Human trafficking is seen as a gender-based driver, very alarming and very concerning. She notes that there are multiple layers of vulnerabilities for women and children to be predisposed to trafficking. Andrea also suggests and notes that gender transform transformative approaches need to be considered when addressing this particular topic. In a recommendation, she notes that survivor-centered services that are trauma-informed should be accessible. And she notes specifically the need for long-term support. She adds that Laws and policies need to be strengthened, that we need to promote economic empowerment of women, which was also supported by Rachel, and that we need to engage with men and boys to change their harmful attitudes that drive sexual exploitation and gender-based violence. Carolina poses a real dilemma in a question for women and survivors. And she says, for many women and girl children, so who can I trust? A real dilemma. When the very people you have trusted have exposed you to human trafficking, the protective layers and safety mechanisms in those relationships have been taken away. And so therefore, without a doubt, trust becomes a major a major concern for these survivors. Who can I trust? And she identifies common cl clinical pres uh, presentations and the predisposition to conditions such as complex PTSD, depression, and anxiety. Joy confers and says that survivors of human trafficking all display PTSD, all of them, without a doubt, all of them through the many cases that they've, um, of survivors that they've rescued. Joy in helping survivors of human tra trafficking heal says, and she poses the question, what happens after someone is trafficked? After having experienced unbelievable trauma and devastating effects of human trafficking. And she says that the girl who left home is a different girl when she returns. 
She highlights that the needs of the survivor to find healing means taking away the blame and the shame and empowering survivors, ensuring that appropriate supportive interventions are provided. She leaves us with a particular statement, a profound statement. She says, survivors need to be reassured that they are never alone, that there's someone, that there's an organization available to support them and provide that safe journey towards healing. Rachel reminds us in her presentation that not trafficking on its own is often not the only trauma that women and girl children have experienced. There are multiple other traumatic events that they may have encountered. And she says, no one single experience can be seen as, uh, uh, would be all different. And there's not one common area that may overlap. There are some commonalities, but she says, Every individual's experience has been unique and different. Shifting the language, shifting the perspectives are critical for addressing stigma of survivors of human trafficking. The ongoing need for validation. I was not at fault. I was not at fault. Remains critical for healing and recovery. Human trafficking is something that has happened to the survivor. It is not their choice. It is not their identity. And she cautions, she cautions interventions that re-traumatizes survivors of human trafficking. She adds that genuine economic independence is critical for these survivors, but also sheds some light on the fact that there is hope and there is healing. As long as there is life, she says, there is hope. Recovery and healing is dependent on all of us, she states. And it reminds me of a quote by Audrey Lord who said, I am not free while any woman is unfree, even when her shackles are different from my own. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not free while any woman remains unfree, even when our shackles are different from, from theirs. So let it not be said that we were silent when they needed us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ingrid, for those um most important closing comments and really wrapping up what the guest speaker shared with us. So we are now over time, it is 8.35. For those of you that have attended, thank you very much. Um, the next webinar, as Julie added, is Refugees and Displaced Women and Impact on Mental Health. We hope you can join us in October. 